you have a real treat tonight. We actually have uh, Doug Hamp is in the house. Amen? Yeah. He's, that's right. He's, he's spoken a few times before. You know, he is uh, truly a gentleman and a scholar. Uh, he is a Hebrewic uh, scholar and a Greek scholar. He's a genius. He's the opposite of me in every way. Um, I really do pray that tonight uh, we would hear what he says and um, some of these things, and it just blesses you. So let's give him a hand. Thank you. What I want to share with you tonight is something that I believe is of utmost importance. I often come and share prophecy with you. Uh, I won't be doing that specifically tonight, but I believe that this is a foundational issue. And I talk about this at length in my new book, Corrupting the Image, because I, I really began to see in Scripture that if we don't understand what the image of God is, we're going to miss so many things. And Satan has been trying to mess up the image of God, right? And so we need to know what really is the image of God. If you ask an average theologian or if you read sort of your average theological book, you will hear things like, well, the image of God, what is it? And they'll say, well, it's hard to say what it is. Let's say what it's not. And they'll say, it's definitely not what he looks like. And then you'll hear things like, it's, it includes love, it includes creativity, it includes passion, it includes intellect, it includes all those things, which I agree with. It certainly does include all those things. The image of God is part of that. But back to the first point, could it include what God actually looks like? Well, the, again, your average theologian would say, no, no way, definitively no. But what does Scripture actually tell us? Remember that God made us in His image and in his likeness. So this is a very much a foundational issue. And if we can understand what it's talking about, a lot of light bulbs are going to go on, I believe. And I think that you will see that is the case as we go through this. So in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is having this, this vision, and he sees uh, this, uh, this whirlwind, this fire, and all these things, and he sees the cherubim. And then he says in verse 26, and above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Now the word there in Hebrew is the word Adam. Adam means Adam, right? So here he's looking, he's seeing in this vision. Now, now keep in mind, he's not in heaven. When the, when the prophets have a vision, you might think of it like putting on virtual reality glasses. If you've ever put on virtual reality glasses, you're kind of in that environment. And we've all probably seen The Matrix or something like that, you know. And you kind of, you enter into that world. Though you're not technically there, you're still here, right? And some, everyone's played a video game, I'm sure, at one point in your life. You know, you really get engrossed in that. Or maybe you've gone to the movies and you feel like you're there, especially with all this 3D and stuff. So the prophets didn't actually go into God's presence bodily, not physically, because nobody could go into the presence of the Lord until Jesus first went with his blood to make the way for us to be there. So the prophet Ezekiel and others like him, they were seeing in a vision, kind of like a television or a virtual reality experience, they were seeing God but not actually being in his presence. So here he's seeing this whole thing, and now he sees the cherubim, and he sees on top this firmament that's over their heads, it's got and the likeness of a throne, the appearance of sapphire stone. We see sapphire stone in the book of Exodus, where it says that Moses, Aaron, Nadav, Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel went up the mountain, and it says, and they saw the firmament or the pavement of sapphire, and they saw God's feet on it. So they saw God's feet on this pavement of sapphire. We see the same uh, sapphire up in Revelation chapter 4 when John sees a vision of God. So he's clearly seeing God. But what does God look like? He looks like Adam. Now you may say, whoa, what's going on here? This is almost getting heretical. But don't, it's not that we're making God into our image. No, of course not. What happened in the beginning? It says that God made us in his image. Okay, so it's not that God bears Adam's image, but Adam bears God's image. And of course, we are all sons and daughters of Adam, and so we share that image, of course, to a much lesser extent. But we still have a lot of similarities and common features to what God looks like. And this is what he says. He says that with the appearance of man or Adam high above it. But see, here's the big difference. 
He says, also from the appearance of his waist and upward I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So there can be no question who he is seeing. But notice here, he sees this fire and he sees, in the English there, it says the color of amber. Now I've put in brackets the word electricity. Because the Hebrew word there is the word chashmal. And if you look at it in the Septuagint, it's the word elektros. And of course, elektros, we can hear that. It sounds like electricity, right? And it actually turns out that, uh, that amber, if you take it and you rub it, it becomes electrically charged. How interesting. So no matter how you look at this, this Hebrew word, the Greek word, and just that substance itself, it has to do with electricity. So what he's seeing is he's seeing God who looks like Adam because Adam looks like God. He, he sees this fire that's coming out of God mixed with electricity. Wow, that's quite the picture of God. Now imagine going and giving God a hug. How would you feel about that? Well, you might feel electrified. <laughs> or you might feel burned out, okay? Because this is exactly what would happen. So you see, we can't even go into God's presence because we're not compatible with God's presence. That's a major problem, isn't it? You know, go try to hang out in a campfire for a little while. Go hang out in a nuclear reactor. There's one over in Fukushima if you want to go try it. Just take a walk and see what happens. It's not going to happen because we are incompatible with that reality. You see? And then others have seen God as well. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Here again, God has a form. Now keep in mind, we're not saying that God is made of anything. It's not that God is made of dirt or he is made of carbon. He's not made of anything, is he? God is God. He is the prime source of all things. He's the first one that ever was and ever will be. He's the prototype. We all are derivatives of him. He's the source. He's the source code. He's the master plan. You know, he's it. So we can't say, what is God made of? Because he's not made of anything. So I can't really tell you, you know, like, what's his body consist of? I don't know. But he has a body. That's the point. It's not made of dirt, but it's God stuff, you know, whatever that is. It's God, right? So, but this is what he looks like. The, the prophet Isaiah sees him sitting. If you're sitting, then you must be, have a body. The prophet Daniel says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. There he goes sitting again. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Again, the prophets are seeing into that realm, and they're seeing what God looks like. Now keep in mind, those theologians say, well, this is just anthropomorphic language. And at first we're wowed, like, ooh, that's a big word. I don't even know what that means. It must be true. It's anthropomorphic language, we say. Can't. But what they're talking about is that, they're, that the Bible or God is using human-like terms to describe himself. And so they say, well, it doesn't really mean that he has hands. It doesn't really mean that he has feet. He doesn't really have hair. That's anthropomorphic language. It's God using human language and, use, and describing himself in human terms to say what he's really like or to say what he's kind of like. And I would say, well, who are they to say? How do they know that? Is there a verse that says that these are anthropomorphisms? No, there's not. What the prophets are seeing is what God is actually like. It's not that he's trying to pull a fast one on us or he's just saying, well, here, this is all you guys can handle. This is what he looks like. And you see, it becomes important as we go on. And you're going to see why when we get to the end of the study. Because it's going to, it's going to really unlock a lot of things for us. When we come to the book of Revelation, of course, this is talking about the Lord Jesus. But we're told in Colossians that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now, part of the challenge is that we serve a God who is one, but he exists in three persons, right? And an analogy that, that I've come up with, I don't know if I was the first to think of it, but anyway, it's in my mind. Think about the sun for a second, that ball of fire up in the sky. Imagine, if you will, you've got the ball of the sun. Let's say that's analogous to the Father. And then you have the rays of light coming out of it. That's analogous to the sun, to Jesus the sun. And the heat and energy is, is analogous to the Holy Spirit. So 
as long as that ball of the sun has been up there, there's always been light coming out of it. And there's always been heat and energy coming as well. Now try to imagine, if you can, the ball up there without any light. You can't do it, can you? If you have one, you necessarily have the other. But where is the light coming from? It's coming from this sphere up there. And it's interesting because in the Nicene Creed, it talks about how Jesus is, it says the word generated, but not created. Very fascinating. That he's generated from the Father, but he's not created. And, I really, and that's the word genes, or monogenes. Okay? The word monogenes, which we have as begotten. In what way is Jesus begotten? Right? We're told in the Psalms, today I have begotten you. How can that be speaking of Jesus? It's not that you know, God gave birth or something like that. We're not talking about that. So here we have this, this Greek concept, and, and it's even a Hebrew concept. The word there is monogenes. How can that be referring to Jesus? Well, again, just if we go back to our analogy, the ball of the sun is generating the light. But as long as there's been this ball of light, go back as far as you possibly can, there has always been light coming from it. And it's the light that makes visible the ball, you see? So if you don't have the, the light, the rays of light coming from it, then you can't see this. And so Jesus is the one who makes visible the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the energy, but he's also a person, of course. So maybe that's the closest we can get, I, I believe, to understanding just a little bit of what the Trinity is like. So we see God in various places. We know that Jesus is part of that, but it's also the Father, it's also the Holy Spirit, so we're doing the best we can. We're getting as close as we can. So here this is speaking about Jesus. And it says, One like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool. That's just like what we read in Daniel 7, 9. As white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice as a sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So Jesus is that same image because he is the image of the invisible God. Paul tells us that if there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. He is, of course, referring to our future. But the truth is still there, that there is such a thing as a spiritual body. We tend to think that when we get up to be with God, we're not going to have you know, really bodies, but we're, we're very much going to have a body and we're told that it's going to be conformed to his body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. What is sown a natural, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Paul goes on in Philippians, he says, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So we're beginning to see this picture if we look at all the scriptures in the Bible that yes, God definitely does have a body. Now again, it's not made of dirt, it's not made of carbon atoms, it's not made of anything, but he does have a body and we are modeled after his body. See that? We're modeled after his body. I think this is really exciting stuff because now, instead of just this fuzzy God that I could never really... What's he look like? You know, I mean, I just can't imagine this blob of, I don't know, something, light or whatever. But no, he has a particular form. He's got a body. And that, I think that's really cool because I'm made in his image. And it kind of makes sense because, you know, I have kids. And if you have kids, what do your kids look like? They look like you. And you think that's cool, don't you? Right? Oh, they're so cute. And I don't care about other people's kids, quite frankly. I really am not even interested. But mine? Oh, man, they are cute. All right? And uh, yes, they can do wrong. But they're amazingly cute. Why? Because they're in my image. When I see, look at them, I'm like, I'm looking at me, you know? It's kind of fun. And they're in my likeness. You know, you begin to see those little things. You're like, now where do they pick up that thing? Oh, it must be from my wife, you know, because the bad habits, of course. You know, all the good ones come from me, naturally. All right? But we begin to see that they, they're modeled after us, not only in their looks, but also the way they act. So again, this gives us something to hold on to. And we're told in Genesis 5.1, it says that Seth, I mean, Adam had a son. Seth 
in his image and in his likeness. The same exact words that God uses to describe how he created Adam in his image and in his likeness. And of course, Seth, you know, was a chip off the old block. He looked like dad. He acted like dad. And so that's what we're like. But of course, we have some issues. And we're going to talk about those issues. <clears throat> the psalmist says this, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Now, the word here for likeness is the Hebrew word tmuna. And we find that in Numbers 12:8, God is called uh, Aaron and Miriam into his office. He says, hey, step in here. I've got to talk. And he says, you know what? Don't be messing with Moses. He's a faithful servant in all my house. And I don't appear to him like I do to others in dreams and visions. But I speak to him face to face. The Hebrew there is actually mouth to mouth. And he says, and he sees the image or the form of the Lord. He sees the form of the Lord. And that's the same word. So that form that Moses saw, we are going to awake in that form, in that likeness. You see? It's important to know what God actually looks like because we're going to be like that. Are you starting to get a little bit excited? Okay, I'm just checking. You know, I know it's been a long work day, but this is exciting stuff. What does Peter tell us? He says, By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. What? Partakers of the divine nature? Seriously? This is beginning to sound heretical or stuff, but there it is. Peter said it. Partakers of the divine nature. God has a lot of cool things in store for us. I'm getting very excited. John says, when he is revealed, we don't know what he's going to be like, but when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When we see the Lord, there's no more veil between us. There's no more, I'm sorry you can't see my face or you'll die kind of stuff. We're going to see him as he is, face to face, nothing between us. But don't forget that fire. Remember the fire of God? It's just going to, it's going to blast. And we're going to look at that in a little bit. Now, something called biophotons and bodies of light. That's the next thing. Okay, so if we're made in God's image, we're made in his likeness. Well, from what I remember, there's this fire and electricity coming out of God. What about that stuff? And why can't I go and be in God's presence right now? Think back to the Old Testament. Remember the high priest... He could not go into the Holy of Holies except once a year. And he's told, listen, you've got to, you know, uh, de- you've got to abstain from your wife for a couple of days. You've got to um, just you know, have all sin out of your life. You've got to take a bath. You've got to put on this special white linen. And then you have to have a sacrifice on your behalf. And then the blood had to be placed here on your forehead, on your hands, and on your feet. You see, what was happening is God was putting on a force field, or the priest was putting on a force field. Never thought of it like that, did you? But that's what it was. He was putting on a force field, a covering, because the blood is what covers, it makes that, it's the Yom Kippur, right? That's the word atonement, but really what it is, is it means to cover. The word kafar is the same word that uh, we find that Noah used to cover the ark with the pitch. That's the same word. So that blood was a covering. And so the high priest had to put that on because where was he going? He was going into the nuclear reactor. You see, the presence of God was in that holy of holies. And you couldn't just walk in anytime you felt like it. It just didn't work that way. Because God's presence, his, his what we call the Shekinah or the Shekinah, was in there. And it was just blasting, okay? And you couldn't just walk in there. You had to go in with fear and trepidation and you had to put on, you had to put on your hazmat suit, right? And you had to put on your force field so you could go in there and actually survive the ordeal. And you could only go once a year. But you see, this is because God wanted to be with his people. I want to be with you guys. I like you. You see, God likes us and he wanted to be with us. But back in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, there was this big divorce. It says that God drove them which is the word to, it's the legaresh, it's to, to divorce, really. He divorced mankind at that point. We might call it a legal separation because he wanted to get back together. He wanted to get back together, but he couldn't dwell with man anymore because man had essentially unplugged himself from God and now we're running on batteries, we're corrupted, God's still holy, still got the fire and all this. So what happens if we, if we dwell with him? No can do, right? 
you, you're dead. You just you can't do it. So God made a, a provisional uh, situation with uh, the sacrifices and all this so that he could still be in the presence. But after they continued to sin again and again and again, God's like, I'm leaving. You can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 8, 9, and 10. God said, I've got to go. And it's almost like as, as he's doing this, it says that the glory began to depart. And it went up on top first of the Mount of Olives, then it went to, uh, to Mount Scopus, and, and, and then it finally departed. It's almost like God saying, okay, I'm leaving. Does anybody notice? Anybody care? <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving. Okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> you know, he's, it's like he's trying to get their attention. Does it, anybody, anybody out there? I'm leaving. And nobody cared. And so then he finally left. And it's a very sad day. But that was the reality. And so, of course, here comes Jesus. We find that he's transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Basically, he's letting his light shine. Okay, He had uh, put a veil on it. He had set that aside while he came down to earth. But he's letting it out. And not all of it, mind you, but just some of it so that they can see what he is really like. And they're like, hey, Lord, this is cool. Let's build some, some booths and we can just hang out up here. So he's transfigured. But what does Jesus say about us? What is our destiny? What's our future hold? This might surprise you. If you're feeling dull, this should help you out. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And we read in Daniel 12, verse 3, those who are wise shall shine. Now, it's the same word, if you're looking at the Septuagint, it's the same exact word that we find in Matthew 13, eklampo, and it means like as a lamp shines out, just like these lights are shining out. And so that's what happened to Jesus at the transfiguration. That's what he says the righteous will do in the kingdom of his Father. And this is what Daniel was, the, the message that he was given, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And then we read in Revelation 19.8, speaking about the body of Christ, it says, It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now that word bright is, is, is again, it's, it's eklampo or lamprotes. It's, it's to shine out. To, to literally shine. You may be thinking, well, this is just figurative language. No, it's not. Because when Jesus was transfigured, that wasn't figurative language. And Jesus himself says that you are going to shine. I'm going to shine. So if you're feeling kind of dull, hey, you're going to be brilliant. You're going to be bright pretty soon. So don't feel too bad. Now, it's fascinating that the ancient Jews understood that, mo that uh, Adam and Eve had that light. And if you think about it, Adam and Eve were in God's presence. There was no sin. There was no corruption, no decay. So they could be with God. It says that God walked in the cool of the day. It's not like you know, he didn't come and hang out with them. That's why he created them, to hang out with them. So they were in his vicinity all the time. And so they're, they're getting God's light. And the rabbis understood this. It says the Midrash Rabbah, which is rabbinic literature from the 1st or 2nd century A.D., says, And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin, and clothe them. In Rabbi Meir's Torah, it was found written, Garments of Light, or, this refers to Adam's garments, which were like a torch, broad at the bottom and narrow at the top. Now, there's, there's a word play that's going on here in Hebrew. The word for skin is the word or, which is spelled uh, ayin resh. Okay? And the word for light is also the word or, but it's spelled with an aleph. It's with a different letter, aleph resh. And they sound identical, or and or. They sound identical. So what the rabbis are understanding is that there's, there's a little clue, what you might call a remez. They're finding this clue in Scripture that Adam had these, this body of light that was shining out. Well, something interesting that was discovered quite recently is something called biophotons. And as we see that we're going to be like him, we're going to have that image. It was discovered in 1923 by a Ukrainian biologist, Alexander Gravisht. He discovered that living things like yeast and onions, produced an ultra-weak photon emission. This was confirmed independently by Russian scientists around 1950. They discovered an ultra-weak photon emission from living organisms. Then it was confirmed by uh, other Italian scientists. It was also confirmed by Japanese scientists at the School of Medicine 
in Kanazawa, Japan. And here's what they say. All organic life absorbs, emits, and processes light. Biophoton emission or spontaneous ultra-weak light emission has been observed from almost all living organisms. And what they go on to say is that it's actually in our DNA. That DNA, your DNA, my DNA, all DNA, it absorbs light and it also emits light. In a way similar to a capacitor, how a capacitor will take electricity, store it, and then will give it out at a later time. It's also like those little glow sticks. You know, you hold those up to the light, turn the lights off, you know, and then you got these little things glowing up there. The kids love them, right? So you have these, this thing. It, it takes in the light, stores it, and then it re-emits the light. That sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? So our DNA actually does this. It takes in light from the sun, and then it, and it, it uh, puts it back out. And you might say, is that in the Bible? It actually is. Remember back to when Moses goes up on top of the mountain. He's up there for 40 days and he comes down. And what's, what's different about him? His face, right? It says, Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. Where did he get that light? How did that happen? I mean, what, what's going on there? You, you go up, you hang out with God for 40 days, and you come down and your face is showing, shining? It's interesting, isn't it? Well, the biophoton uh, phenomenon explains that, that our DNA actually absorbs light, and then it re-emits the light. You see, so as Moses was up there on top of Mount Sinai, and he's just getting God's light, you know, for 40 days, he's getting fully charged, basically. And he comes down, and he's just beaming, okay? Boo. He's got this light coming out of his face, and they're like, oh, man, this is weird. All right, now, it eventually went away. It went away because he was no longer in God's presence all the time. And secondly, he's got this body that's got some serious issues. It's got corruption, decay, death, and all that stuff in it. So when we get our new bodies, we're going to have, it's going to be perfect, no corruption, and we're going to be completely in God's presence. And so we're going to have God's light coming at us, you're just sucking it up. Mmm, this is good, right? And then you're re-emitting it. And this is, of course, what the angels do, right? When we see angels, they're called stars in Scripture. Because why, do they, why are they called stars? Because they shine, right? They shine. I mean, that's, that's what the angels do. And, and this is why when people would see an angel, they'd be afraid because they were shining. Not, not all the time, but many times when they would see an angel, they would shine. And so this is the reality. We can read about it in, in the Gospels. We see it. In the book of Revelation, that angels would shine as well. And so now here Moses is in God's presence, and he comes down and he's got that shining face. So when we get our new bodies, we get to be in God's presence, we receive his light, it goes into our DNA, and then it's re-emitted as light. So it's not our light that's going to be shining, but it's his light coming into us and then going back out. So that's exciting. Now here's where it gets a little bit, well, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. So we're all going to stand before the Lord someday, believers and non-believers, whether it's in the rapture or death or whatever, we're all going to be before him someday. Remember we talked about how God has this fire and electricity coming out of him. So what's going to happen to the non-believer? You see, he, he doesn't have that garment of light. Remember in Matthew 22 where Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who had a son and he's going to have this wedding feast and the people that are invited don't want to come, so he says, okay, go out and you know, shake up the bushes and get anybody to come. And so all these people show up, and then he goes in, and he sees a guest who doesn't have a wedding garment on. Now, in the Old Testament, those are called the garments of salvation. So you've got to have a garment of salvation. Revelation 19.8 again, it says, To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, pure and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So you've got to have the wedding garment. The wedding garment is a free gift. It's given to us by virtue of what the Lord Jesus did on the cross. And if you don't have a wedding garment, guess what? You're out. doesn't matter if you got the general invitation when he went out to the highways and byways and called whoever, or if you had the special RSVP, please come to my wedding feast, which was given to the Jews. And they said, well, we're busy, you know. It doesn't matter. If you've got the RSVP, if you just got invited you know, on Facebook, hey, you want to come to my party? Okay, sure, um, nothing else to do. But you still got to have that wedding garment. And if you don't have the wedding garment, 
you're in trouble. Right? So when the non-believer stands before the Lord, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Now, we often we hear about this place called hell. Right? Not a nice place. No matter how you slice it, don't want to be there. But what exactly is that? And where does all that fire come from? Did God, you know, special make that so that he could really torment people? I've got to make something to really make people suffer. I know, I'll think I'll make this lake of fire. It'll be fun. No, it doesn't work that way. You see, what's going to happen is the non-believer, he gets up in front of the presence of the Lord, doesn't have a wedding garment on. He's in trouble. And we read here in Revelation 14.10, speaking of those who take the mark, it says, He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. We read about the same thing in Isaiah 30, verse 33. It says, For Tophet was established of old. Yes, for the king it is prepared. Now you can also look there at Isaiah 14.5 and Ezekiel 28.12. The king that is being spoken of here is none other than Satan. Remember in Matthew 25 where he's got the whole sheep and the goats judgment going on and you know the righteous say, Oh Lord, when did we ever see you? And he says, When you did to the least of these my brethren... And then the unrighteous, the, the goats, stand before him and they say, Lord, when did we see you ever naked or hungry or sick? And he says, whenever you didn't do it to these. And he says, okay, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, into the eternal fire that is prepared for Satan and his angels. Right? So, so this, this, this place of hell was first established for Satan. And this is the Old Testament text that proves that. For Tophet. And I've got the verse below it that gives us the definition of what is Tophet. Jeremiah 7.31 And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. So the valley of the son of Hinnom, and the, the Hebrew word valley is the word ge, and uh, Hinnom, this becomes ge Hinnom or Gehenna. And Jesus talked about this place called Gehenna is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So Isaiah says, For Tophet, or Gehenna, was established of old, yes, for the king, Satan, is, is prepared. He has made it deep and large. Its pyre is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. Wow. Think back to Daniel chapter 7. We saw that. He, Daniel says, And I watched until thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated, and the hair of his head was like white as wool, and his garment was white like the snow. And he says, the wheels of his throne were a fiery flame, and a fiery stream issued from before him. So there's this fire that's coming out of God. Of course, we saw that in Ezekiel. This fire is coming out of God. And when the non-believer stands before God, what happens? No garment on, no garment of salvation. Naked, laid bare. All that corruption, all that sin, just there. And here's the holy God, got fire coming out of him, electricity. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to be torment, isn't it? Now, he's not done away with because he's eternal. He's in God's image still. But he doesn't have the wedding garment on. And now, you know, he doesn't have his hazmat suit on. He's now in God's presence. He's, he's in the nuclear reactor with no lead suit on. There he is, getting blasted. Now, God segregates these people and puts them in this place called Tophet. We read about that in Isaiah 66:24, where it says, They will look upon the corpses of those men who transgressed against me, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's what Jesus kept talking about in Mark chapter 9. He kept saying, hey, it's, it's better to cut off your hand than to go to this place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's, he took that from the book of Isaiah. So this is all the same place. But it's not that God you know, just kind of made this fire and he's just letting it burn. No, no. It's the exposure to God himself. See, they're going to be tormented in the presence of the Lamb. Second Thessalonians 1 says, When Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The word from there, you might think, well, it's because they're put way over there. Well, yes, on the one hand. But the word apo is the Greek word. It means from. But it can be destroyed not from spatially, but destroyed on account of. They're destroyed on account of, by virtue of. You see? It's kind of like, you know, well, he died from drinking too much. He died from hypothermia. 
he died from overdosing, right? We use the same thing. And these people are going to be destroyed from the presence of the Lord. It's the presence of the Lord, it's his fire that is doing them in. And there's nowhere to run, you see? Because in that day, we're told in Isaiah 25 that the, the, the covering that now covers all people, is he's, God says, I'm going to swallow up on this mountain, the, the, the covering that covers all people will be swallowed up and the veil that is over all peoples will be removed. So that the veil between us and God, the veil between our dimension and that dimension, our physical earthly realm and that spiritual domain, it's going to be taken away. And now we read about it also in Revelation that the sky is going to be, re, re, uh, it's going to be rolled up like a scroll. Isaiah 34 talks about that. And he says, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Right? The sky is going to go back. The covering that's between us is going to be taken away. And now God's fire is just going to come back. He's going to come back with fire and flaming fire. Can you imagine this? My goodness, whoa. This isn't hyperbole, guys. This is the real thing. And what are the men on the earth going to say? Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. <laughs> We're done, man. We're just done. We've got to hide, but there's going to be nowhere to hide. Nowhere to hide. And it, it's, I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's wrath, God's wrath against their actions, but on the other hand, it's just really kind of a cause and effect. You know, you don't have your wedding garment on. You remain in that corrupted state. And now you're exposed to the holy, righteous, pure, living God who is the power plant of the universe. And he's, it's way worse than any nuclear power station. But that's the best thing I can come up with. All right? And there's nowhere to run now. You're just stuck. But we're going to put you over here because it's kind of an eyesore to look at you all the time. All right, so we're going to put you in this place called Tof. But, but still, where did the fire come from? From God. It's not that he's just like, you know, cooking over here, trying to turn up the flames. No, not that at all. You see, so when we explain to people this concept of hell, it's not just that, well, God made this place called hell, and that's where you're going. Well, why would a loving God send anybody to that place? That's not a bad question. Why would he send anybody to that place? Well, he's not really sending anybody to that place. You've now come into his presence, and you don't have your wedding garment on. And he kept trying to get you to... You know, get a wedding garment. And you said, no, nah, I don't need it. So now there you are, exposed. Nowhere to go. And that's your reality. Now, unless you think that we get away scot-free, what is our destiny? Now, we have a wedding garment, right? Because we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of the work that he did on the cross, we get to go there by his grace. And the wedding garment's free, okay? But, again, Revelation 19.8, To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, pure and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saint. How interesting. Then we read in 1 Corinthians 3.12-15, through 15, Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, that's when he comes back, the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. There's that word fire again. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, there's a temptation to say, well, this is, this is hyperbole or it's allegorical talk, figurative language. I mean, we're not going to... I mean, we're believers, right? So we're not going to go through the fire, right? That's for the unbeliever. I disagree. Guess what? We're going to stand before God. And what is God again? Right? Fire. Massive amounts of energy coming at you, okay? It's this, this, this stream of fire is issuing from before him. Now, to the unbeliever, that does him in. But to the believer, it's going to charge us up. But that, that initial time when we get there, when we stand before the Lord... This is when we get there and we come with our baggage. They say you can't take anything to heaven. Well, unfortunately, you can't. And you can take all those lousy, good-for-nothing works that you did. In fact, you will take them, right? And so, you know, I imagine myself, there I am. My garment is the righteous acts, okay? So I've, you know, I've done some things for the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm going to have a pretty good suit here, you know? I mean, okay, the basic suit is, is issued by God. It's free. But my level of luminosity appears to be somewhat dependent on what I do for him. All right, so 
I get there, I'm, I'm glowing, you know, but then I, I start to notice, I've got all these black spots on me, like kind of like sunspots, you know, I'm like, where did these things come from? Well, oh yeah, I remember, this is the one where I kept trying to exalt myself. And this one over here, it's when I gave that 500 bucks, but I was doing it for my own glory. I was trying to score points. And here's one where I was bragging about all the things that I did. Oh, yeah, I went to this country and I did all these things for these people, you know. And I was really trying to build up my kingdom. I was trying to build up Doug. And he's like, hey, welcome, Doug, you know. And all the little black spots on me that I did for me, guess what happens to those? Those are wood, hay, and stubble. They're gone. They're up in smoke. And then the things that I did for the Lord, those are going to remain. So this is very literal. Again, take the Bible literal. You just got to connect the dots. You take the Bible literal and you begin to see that this fire is going to test me. And I think the reason that the Lord is letting us go through various trials and tribulations here, Peter tells us that it's to have gold refined in the fire. Here's what I'm thinking. He's like, you know, I'll let you go through some trials here so that we can reduce that wood, hay, and stubble. And we'll, we'll try to convert it into gold, silver, and precious stones. Because if you don't, when you stand before me, it's just going to go up and... So better to have some trials here and now so that you're refined, you're purified, and when you get before me, all I'm going to see is gold, silver, and precious stones. But if I just kind of let you go on and you, you know, just kind of remain this shallow person, you ever had the prayer, Lord, I really like being shallow. Can I just not have any trials? I, 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 you know, I, I don't mind. It's not so bad. I, I don't need to be deep, really. I don't. Just let me be shallow. Is that so bad? He's like, yeah, uh, not so good. Let's give you some trials so that we can get rid of that junk and all those impurities and so that when you stand before me, you're going to be pure. Now, I'm convinced I'm still going to have quite a few spots and they're going to just go up in flames. But take heart. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So let this be a reminder to us. We are going to stand before the Lord. God is no respecter of persons. doesn't matter what your name is. doesn't matter how big a checks you write to people. Are you doing it for the Lord? Are we living for Him? Are we compromising with the world? Are we watching trashy TV, guys? Are we listening to junk on the radio? Are we wasting our time? You know, it's not only the, the obvious things. Sometimes it's just, we're just, we're loitering. You know, we're just kind of, kicking back and doing nothing. We're like, I'm just waiting for the rapture. It's all good. No. This is the time. If we believe that the end is near, then this is the time to go. Now, whatever God's called you to, it may be different than your neighbor. Maybe it's not street evangelism. But do something. Pray about it. Lord, what do you want me to do? Because I'm going to stand before you. And I'm a little bit nervous about that. Fire. <laughs> this is fire, guys. It's real. It's God's fire. And it's going to consume us. Now, the... the you know, it, it doesn't mean that, I mean, this is kind of a, this is an event. This is a one-time deal, okay? So those things get burned up, and then we're good to go. But wouldn't it be nice to have a few more, you know, of the, the other things, the gold, silver, precious stones? Let's try to convert it before it's too late. And this is our opportunity. And so the fear of the Lord, and we want to we just keep seeking His face and doing those things that He desires. And He's trying to weed out of us all the junk, all the times we justify, but this isn't so bad, and... You know, all those things, those little, little, we think they're little, but it's sin. If, it's, if, if it, God doesn't like it, then it's bad. And we've got to keep giving those things to the Lord. Say, wow, Lord, okay, I, I, I'm ready to give up this sin. You know what, I was trying to justify it and hold on to it and say that it's okay, but I realize it's not. And I just want to forsake that. So God is interested in righteousness. He's interested in pure lives. Don't say, well, that's legalistic. No, no, this is, this is, this is real stuff. He wants us to be righteous, to live for him. Be on fire for him. All right? And here's what Jesus tells us. Constantly be on your guard so that your hearts may not be loaded down with self-indulgence, drunkenness, and the worries of this life. Now, I can understand self-indulgence and drunkenness. I mean, those are obviously bad things. But look, he also says the worries of this life. We can let those worries of this life consume us. So that we're always working, we've got to pay the insurance, got to pay the car, got to pay the mortgage. We get so busy with these things that it consumes us. We're loaded down. This is all we're thinking about. Got to pay the rent. Got to pay the rent. Got to do this and got to do that. You know, maybe it's time that we reduce. Don't go into debt. Pay off that credit card and don't use it again. It's time to take some radical steps. Big changes are coming upon the world. They're not far away. They are not far away. I'm telling you. They're coming. And he says, you know, look, 
Or that day will surprise you like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the earth. So be alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to take your stand in the presence of the Son of Man. How is he coming back? With flaming fire. Now, I believe that we are going to be with him on those horses we read about in Revelation chapter 19. But no matter, no matter when we arrive, we're going to stand in God's presence. We're going to stand before the Lamb. And he's, this, he's got this fire coming out. You, you can't escape that. It's a sure thing. So be on your guard. Don't be loaded down, whether it's you know, self-indulgence or if it's drunkenness or if it's the worries of this life. Careful. Let's be on, let's be on our guard. Be aware for it's coming and we're going to stand before him. We want to stand before him and he, hear him say, well done. All right, that's our goal. And he loves us. All right? He loves us. He really he wants the best for us. And that's why he wants to get rid of that junk now. Let's just, get, let's just forsake it. Let's not live for that stuff anymore. Let's live for him. Because it's going to be a glorious day. I, amen? It's going to be very glorious. And I'm excited. So let's, uh, let's live for him. Lord, we love you so much. But Lord, we pray that you would help us to not be flippant about our, our relationship with you or to be so casual. Well, it's all going to work out. But Lord, may we be on guard. And because we look for all these things, may we, be found, may we be diligent to be found pure and spotless. Spotless, Lord. We want to be spotless. Because all the spots that remain are going to be burned, so we want to be spotless. We ask you to forgive us for our slothfulness at times. Lord, forgive us for building our own kingdom versus building your kingdom. And Lord, we pray you'd strengthen us. You know that we're dust. So Lord, have mercy on us. Encourage us. Show us the way. Lord, show us new and mighty things. We want to see you, Lord. Show us in dreams and visions what's coming so that we would be watching, watching and ready when you come to take us. We love you so much. We give you the praise and the glory for you are the only God who is worthy. There are other usurpers who try to say that they're God. But Lord, there is none. You are the creator of heaven and earth you deserve all the praise. And we give, you, we give it to you, Lord, because you are worthy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.